tonight. Good to be in the Lord's house. We welcome you here. Uh, real quickly, um, as we're going to do the announcements, and I'll come back and do the prayer request. Uh, uh, let's see here. Real important um, uh, guided prayer is Friday is Friday night. We want to remember that. So please, uh, that's just a huge uh, prayer meeting for our church uh, uh, this Friday. What time does it start? Six o'clock. Yeah. 6.30, I'm sorry. So let's remember that. This, this is very important. If you can be here, by all means, please uh, I'll pray. We, we were averaging now around 40 people coming out for prayer, and that just blesses my heart, you know, so good. And Sunday night we had an amazing service here. All, it, was, it was all good. Preaching was that, but all the service was good. And uh, we uh, after the all, regular altar service was over, people were just uh, – hanging around the altars, and we just had a, a probably about an hour and a half altar service uh, after the Sunday night service was over. So it was just a beautiful time of spending time with the Lord. And, um, you know, and yeah, how many of you know God's doing some things in this world, amen, in America? And, uh, you know, somebody say, oh, it's this or that. L listen, we, we're not trying to copy or duplicate, or we're not trying to replicate anything that's going on like at Asbury. And I've been following that. Many of you have. If you don't know, it's a small college in Kentucky that's that's had a prayer revival. And they've been praying around the clock and worshiping and singing and testifying. And no, no, nobody's leading it as far as no big name or anything like that. And it's a spontaneous. And, and people say, well, we, you know, different ones are trying to copy. Look, I just want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of what the Lord's doing in this last day, amen. So we want to remember that, and you can be a part of something like that because we're going to come out and we're going to be uh, in, in corporate guided prayer. And it's, it's a beautiful thing, so I encourage you to come out and be with it. I, I told you my goal is to change the culture of our church so that the prayer meeting is the most important service uh, that we have. we got a long way to go, but we're going to get there, amen. Um, let's see here. Saturday, Sunday night, we're not having church here. We are uh, our choir, praise team, and uh, and musicians, and uh, hopefully everybody else that wants to come. We're going to Robertsonville at the Grace Pentecostal Holiness Church to have revival for them. I was over there today, uh, uh, walking the prayer the grounds with the pastor, praying and going inside and praying. They're praying tonight for the revival, and we're we're looking forward, and we're going to uh, kick it off Sunday night with y'all. And uh, So if you'll be uh, aware of that so that you don't come here Sunday night, don't lay home, don't stay home and lay out and watch the ball game. Come on, the church on Sunday night, and they, we'll get the directions out. It's, uh, it's in Robertsonville right off the interstate there or the highway. And uh, the church bus, the church bus, the church van – uh, will be uh, available if anybody is interested in going. But we need to hear from you pretty quickly. Uh, the van will leave here. The service starts at 6 Sunday night, so we need to probably leave here. It's about a 40, not quite 40 minutes from here, 35 minutes uh, from here. So uh, we'll figure out a time to leave, but we, um, we need to be there by 6. So if you want to ride the van, anybody's interested in the choir, praise team, whatever, please let us know. Uh, Emma Waters and Jacob Williams' wedding is uh, this Saturday. And that's February the 25th at First Baptist Church on Harvey Street in Washington. Uh, that'll be uh, ceremony will begin at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, please be reminded of that. Grief share is still going on. And let's see. I'm sorry, I wasn't going to do this tonight, but I, all these other uh, things that are going on, I thought we needed to make sure. Uh, also tonight, I want us to certainly be in re uh, remembrance of Fred Squire uh, uh, and their family. Fred's brother passed away. I believe today wasn't it, Brother Craig? Today, and uh, we want to be in uh, certainly be remembering uh, their family in our prayers tonight. Uh, before we take any other prayer, well, let's go ahead and do the prayer request, and then Sister Ann's going to come, and then we'll pray. Does anybody have an outspoken need? Want to remember Christine Lacant? She had a really bad day today. Uh, that's Sister Eva's uh, niece, and we want to remember her. We, she was here Sunday night, the Sunday night before when we had that prayer service, and we want to continue to pray for her. Shirley Berry, Raybon Harris, Lizzie Peterson, and um, uh, Zach Martin. Continue to remember all those needs tonight. Anybody else have an outspoken need before we go to the Lord in prayer? Anybody uh, continue to
Absolutely, absolutely. Don't please don't let me forget that. Amen. Anybody else tonight? Anybody remember Sister uh, Ellen and continue to pray for her hand as she's recovering from both of those surgeries. And uh, um, I told her uh, that if she needs, she's supposed to play for me Sunday night. I said, well, if you need to take off tonight and Sunday morning, you can do it. And uh, she's here tonight, so she didn't take me up on that. Amen. Anybody else tonight? Any? Yeah, Brother Kenny's going for a biopsy tomorrow. Let's remember that need to, uh, for a great report in the Lord. Somebody else tonight. Sister Judy? Yes, yes. Remember Sister Judy's MRI tomorrow. Anyone else tonight? Amen. Amen. All right, Sister Ann, do you come and share that, and then I'll lead us in prayer. Well, I can tell you tomorrow night at the women's meeting, we're going to be celebrating our great God and how he demonstrates his love to his people. You know, God does wonderful things for us, and sometimes we fail to give him credit for that. And who knows, we are at, we've asked the ladies to come to the meeting, you know, for some of them that are in, all of them, if they will, those that are willing to share some prayer that God has answered, some miracle, some situation that God has moved in. And who knows, one of these requests that we've brought forward tonight may be answered and might can be shared in the meeting tomorrow night. Sister Patricia will be bringing the devotion. Again, we're going to be meeting down in the fellowship hall at 7 o'clock, and we're going to talk about the goodness and the greatness of God. But we want you to come with a heart full, a, a heart full of celebration, of who our great God is. We we have a sign-up sheet in the foyer, but if you have not signed up and at the last minute, you're like, I really want to go. Amen. I really want to go to that meeting. Then come on and be with us. Um, we just love, would love to have you there. So again, that's tomorrow night at 7. We look forward to seeing you. Sister, you got me so excited, I want to go. Amen. We're we'll just staying tonight. It is for the ladies, and that's for all age groups. We inc we want to encourage our young ladies, um, we you uh, older everybody. Please come out and be a part of that. Amen. Would you bow your heads? Let's let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we we're so thankful tonight, God, again, and the privilege. The blessing, what a blessing it is to be together again with the people of God. And thank you, Lord, for this faithful uh, group of people here tonight that have come together to magnify and to glorify your name. But, Lord, we don't have to wait tomorrow night to talk about the goodness of the Lord. We can say thank you, God, that you're a good God right now. And, Lord, what an awesome and almighty God you have been. You have been merciful, full of grace, Lord, to us, God. When we deserve the wrath and the judgment of God, you extended a hand of mercy, Lord. So tonight, on behalf of all these needs, Lord God, is Lord, I would probably be unable to remember all of them, but, God, every name that has been lifted up, Every prayer need, every hand, Lord, that we raise right now, signifying, God, there's a special need, God. Those that are going to the, uh, for facing a biopsy, those that are facing procedures, those that are battling cancer, Lord, uh, all of our needs, Lord, none too big, too small to bring to the throne of grace. So tonight, God, we, and Lord, in this prayer, we pray over the singing, the worship, the praise. We pray over the ministry of the word of God. Tonight, God, we pray for our young people in the back, Lord, in their classes back there. And thank you for a beautiful group of children that are being brought up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And, Father, we pray for Sunday morning and services here, God. And then for the revival next week, God, I, I pray, God, as I, I seek your direction, Lord. And we're just going to pray the glory of and the majesty of God would manifest in every service, Lord. And, Lord, thank you for what you're doing in places like Osbury College, Asbury College. College and Lee University and other places, Lord, that are experiencing a move of God. And Lord, so for the Alley Good Church of God, we extend our heart and our prayer to you. Say, Lord, let it happen here. God, send revival in our midst. Would you lift your hand and begin to bless the Lord as we get ready to sing praises unto him. Hallelujah. Sister Allie, if you'd like to come join us, she's a good soprano and we don't have one. So. <laughs> and she volunteers. We love volunteers, don't we? <laughs> We're going to sing a, a song. My first introduction to this song was when I was a young girl, and um, I was fascinated by gospel, Southern Gospel Quartet piano players, if you can imagine that I would be interested in that. And I would beg my daddy to take me to every gospel concert that was anywhere near Windsor Williamson that I could get to. And my first recollection of this song was a gospel quartet singing, 
redeemed, a song of the church. And so we're going to kind of do it like the Southern Gospel Quartets did. We're going to sing the verse sort of straight, and then we're going to pick up and go into evangelistic, double timing the chorus. So when we get to that chorus, just put your hands together and clap, and, um, and let's just sing it for the glory of God. Brother Bateman is preaching on authentic Christian Christianity. <laughs> Christianity. So, so this song is just talking about redemption and redeemed. And aren't we glad we are redeemed? Hallelujah. Lord, that we are indeed redeemed. 
by the blood of the Lamb, that the people of God sing a song that the angels cannot sing. I am redeemed. Thank you, Lord, again. Now, Father, bless this offering tonight as we present, uh, Lord, just a, a, a token of our appreciation, Lord, of, of an abundance out of the, all the things that you have given us. Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of this church and their tithing and their offering, their missions given toward the alms of the giving to the poor and the needy. Lord, you've you're just been good to us, Lord, and we, for those things we're so thankful thankful. We bless you and we praise you. And everybody said amen. You can come out of your seats or you can go to the back. God bless you as you give. to ask you to stand when you just sat down. <laughs> we're in the house of the king, so we're going to stand for the king. This is a beautiful song, and um, as we're studying authentic Christianity, we certainly want the Lord to make us and mold us and shape us into what he'd have us, have us be. So let's sing the song, The Potter's Hand.
Lord. Yes, Lord. Let it be our prayer tonight, God. Yes. Just a moment, just a moment. Let's worship him. Come on, give him your best worship. It don't have to be loud. Just give him your best worship right now, Lord. We we bless you. We honor you tonight, God. It's you said you seek those that'll worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. Lord, I'm in your house tonight. I'm taking this opportunity to worship you. I bless you, Lord. I thank you tonight, God. You're so good. You're so good to us, Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank everybody tonight, amen. You can go ahead and be seated in the presence of the Lord as we look at probably, I'm pretty sure this will be the last one on authentic Christianity. I'm going in a different direction uh, next Wednesday night, good Lord willing. And um, we just thank God for the opportunity uh, to be here tonight. If you love the Lord and you're happy you're saved, say amen. All right, well, most of you are all right. Amen. I want to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And, you know, there's a lot of things. Here, here's the challenge tonight. Now listen to me before I read the scripture. The challenge tonight is to look at what I'm going to preach on and what we've been talking about as far as authentic Christianity and say, does this look like me? I want that to be a challenge to each and every one of us that this what the Bible teach, not what Gary Bateman teaches or other teachers teach. Does the does the Word of God does my life line up with what the Word of God says? Authentic Christianity would look like, and I I think hopefully uh, these sermons and these these type of teachings and series is part of our discipleship process as we grow together in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, would you say amen? Do you want to grow? Amen. You want to grow. You want to be a better Christian. You want to be a stronger Christian than you were yesterday or that last week. You know, I, I don't want to be in the same place I was last year. I want to have matured more. I, I pray that, there, uh, that I'd be a better uh, husband, pastor, father, Christian brother, all the above, and only only way I can do that is to continue to grow in the ways of the Lord. So I can tell you, there's a lot of things authentic Christianity is not. Authentic Christianity is not a flesh based, uh, flesh driven, emotional response to some type of stimuli. You know, uh, the early church never had any of the things that we have. The early, church, the early church was persecuted, prosecuted, chased, humiliated, uh, flogged, beaten, put to death. They didn't have padded pews, air conditioned, heat, lights, mirrors in action, and smog machines, and you name it, and all of these things that we think are so near and dear to Christianity. But with, without a doubt, none of that was even around uh, in, during the early church. And, and see, what happens during times of persecution and times of, uh, of, of assault against the church, uh, the, throughout history, the cream rises to the top. We will not capitulate. We will not bend the knee to compromise. We will not bend the knee to the cultural tide uh, of, of of what what the culture said the church ought to be, and, and if you haven't noticed, and I keep bringing this up, and it's not to be redundant, it's not redundant, it's not to be repetitive. We are in for the fight of our lives. The church is getting ready to face uh, a season that I believe is going to be it's going to be devastating in one way, but the wheat's going to be separated from the chaff, chaff, and the the cream is going to rise to the top. God is looking for men and women who are sold out that have authentic Christianity. I think of the martyrs. I think of of those that have given their life for the cause of Christ. Uh, they are not people uh, unlike what we see uh, that need to be 
babied and, and coddled and, and, and you know, so easily offended and every little thing turns him upside down. When we're talking about people that are willing to say, you know what, before I, before, uh, I renounce Christ or before I deny Christ, I'll lose my life. I'm telling you, church of the living God, the church is going to face a season. I know that's not popular, but we better be prayed up. We better be rapture ready. We better be laser focused on our relationship with the Lord. Would you say amen? So now let's look at the scriptures. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul here uh, speaking to a church, and, and, and he said, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency, and he was a very educated man. Most uh, Some scholars say that he had the equivalent of two, H, two PhDs back then, and but we know that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and we know that he was highly educated and a very religious man, but he said, I didn't come with you with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. This is in verse 2 now. He said, boy, I determined not to know anything among you. I want you to get this. Now, this is sort of what we would call hyperbole, and it's a style of writing that is meant to emphasize what he's about to say. It does, it, it, you know, obviously, Paul has more to, more to know and more to explain than just Christ and him crucified, but he's making a point here. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so what, what authentic Christianity and authentic, authentic Christians, uh, when, when it's, we peel away all the facade and all the, the, the vernacular and all of the bells and whistles and all of the uh, trappings of modern day Christianity, when you peel it all away, you, what you have left is the cross of Calvary and him crucified. Where, where Jesus Christ, listen to me now, redeemed all mankind unto him and, and made a plan so that you and I I can live eternally with God. That ought to make everybody in here happy. Brother Craig, um, not Brother Craig, Brother Chad, would you please turn down the heat? I'm about to burn up here. Don't turn the air conditioner on. Just turn the heat down. Thank you, sir. I told some people that, and they'll go out there and turn the air conditioner on down to about 64. Amen. Then we'll all be freezing. Paul the Apostle is not saying here, listen now, he's not saying I'm not going to tell you about the character and the holiness of God. He said I'm not going to tell you about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit we'll see in 1 Corinthians and uh, later on in this chapter where he talks about the gifts of the Spirit, the operation of the Spirit, the speaking, explanation of speaking in tongues, and all of those wonderful things uh, uh, that he'll talk about. He's not saying that I'm, uh, I, I don't, I'm only going to know Christ and him crucified. He's not even saying that I'm not going to talk about other great doctrines of the Bible, repentance and uh, the propitiation and, uh, 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 you know, and reconciliation, all of those things. He's not saying that None of those things are important. But as an authentic Christianity, if we don't get back to the person and the, and, and the work of Jesus Christ, we're missing the point. Jesus Christ has come to redeem mankind from sin. Come on and say amen. Jesus Christ has come to set us free. Jesus Christ and the cross. That is the message. Uh, uh, Spurgeon said that if you're going to preach Christ, uh, preach a sermon without Christ in it, you might as well go home is what he said. And so what he's saying is that all all this, you know, it's re, it is re, drives me crazy. Short trip to all of this preaching. You know, I, I listen to all kinds of different preaching uh, and, and, and as for for research, and I will listen to some of these uh, what I would call these emergent churches and these uh, seeker friendly churches, and and the doctrine that they're teaching and they're preaching is so appealing. Uh, to the masses and to the flesh. That's why the churches are slam packed full, but there's no preaching on repentance. There's no preaching on the cross of Calvary and denying yourself and being redeemed. One, one well-known, uh, very popular preacher has said that uh, you, 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 uh, you were already saved, you just didn't know it. That's blasphemy. Did you hear what I said? That's blasphemy. And if I told you his name, I'm about to say it. Somebody say, get bold, preacher. No, I'm just Furtick said it. Stephen Furtick said it. And, and that's blasphemy. 
Because if you're already saved and you just found out, then there was no need for Christ to come. That, that's exactly right. That's fundamental. And, and thousands of people uh, that, that, are, that are so attracted to that kind of preaching and that kind of ministry style. And, and somebody said, well, he could have said it in ignorant. Yes, he probably did because that is a very ignorant statement. And you say, oh, you're just so big and bad up here. And, you know, he's a worldwide preacher and he preaches all over the world. And he's a multimillionaire. And his son is a rapper who uses profanity and he endorses his rap music. You want to get me started? I'm not even going to go there. That's not even what my sermon is about. It just makes me so angry that people gravitate to such garbage. And when, when, when that kind of statement is made, people are sitting there and they don't. If Christ, if, if the cross, if Paul the apostle says, I don't want to know anything but Christ and him crucified, if you're already saved, you don't need a Christ. If you're already saved, you don't need a cross. And I could go on, but I'm not. There's a lot of other crazy mess. They said, first time I ever watched that mess, he used a water gun to shoot people. First time I said, you know, I'm going to check this guy out. I don't want to be hard. I don't want to be mean. I don't want to be spiteful. I, I, don't, I'm, I said, the first, first sermon I ever watched, he sat there with a great big water gun and shot people in the service. I thought, wow, don't take much to entertain people this day and time. Honey, I'm trying to help somebody tonight. It's not up here to, 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 uh, to throw stones at elevation or to throw stones at him. But I'm telling you, when we get away from preaching Christ and him crucified and repentance, then that, that's why this kind of stuff is so popular. That's why this stuff it, it, it appeals to people because nobody wants to hear about authentic Christianity being you've got to die out to sell. You got to lay down your life so that you can live for Him. That you've been bought with a price. It's not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb. I want somebody to tell me the truth. Don't lie to me to make me feel good. Tell me the truth. Amen. Preach Christ and Him crucified. I didn't. Again, I've not come here. I know this is online, and I, you know, I, I didn't come here to to throw stones and to be critical. But the preaching of the cross is what separates authentic Christianity from all this other junk. The word faith movement. I, I'm. Oh gosh, help me to be kind tonight. I can name names. And it's hard for me because people would just say, "Yo, you're just a dumb backwood preacher. Don't know your head from a hole in the ground." But I preach Christ and Him crucified. I'm gonna preach Christ and Him crucified. And, and the word faith movement would, will, has has denigrated, has downgraded our God to a cosmic sugar daddy in the sky. Because whatever they say and they confess, God is automatically bound to, to your words are faith-filled containers that force God to do whatever you declare with your mouth. That's garbage, people. They, they quote the scripture in Romans as call those things as not and those as they, are, as they were. Uh, and that's, if you read that in its context, it's speaking about God. You can't speak nothing into existence. Did you get that on the internet? You cannot speak anything into existence. I double D, I'm, I'm sorry, I never say this in the pulpit, but I've said it two weeks in a row. I double dog dare you. Come up here and speak something into existence out of nothing. You say, well, Brother Bateman, you're not, we know that. We, we're smart Christians. We're, but I'm telling you, there is a generate, there are millions of people that are caught up into this hypocrisy and the, this false doctrine that somehow the words that you say can somehow create something out of nothing. That is not authentic Christianity. The Christians say, if the Lord's willing. This, this kind of stuff. And, 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 if, and they believe that they teach a what they call a divine health. Not a divine healing, but divine health. That if you got enough faith that God will heal you, but if God doesn't heal you, it's because you don't have enough faith. They preach a hundredfold doctrine that if you'll give to their ministry, 
that God will return to you a hundredfold. I can't wait to meet Benny Hinn. I can't wait to run into Ken Copeland. Maybe one day the Lord will cross their paths with me. I'm going to walk right up to Ken Copeland who's worth $700 million. I'm going to say, oh, Kenny boy, because I won't call him brother. I said, if you hand me that, hand me $700 million, you get a hundredfold return. Right? If that's what he preaches and that's what he believes, why don't he hand Gary Bateman $700 million? Because that means God's going to give him, I can't even do the math. And it's amazing. And you say, brother, you're being hard and you're, 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 you're picking on. No, I'm not. I'm just trying to, the, the ridiculousness that is out there, what is being preached, and people are so hungry to hear the truth and they're sapping this stuff up because they, they, do, they won't know authentic Christianity if they heard it. Paul said, I don't want to know anything save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The redemptive activity of God becoming flesh, coming to this earth, dying on the cross, taking upon himself the sins of the world to save you and I to redeem us back to God. Oh, that's not, that's not glamorous. That's not amazing. Oh, that, that's amazing to me because that's amazing grace, how sweet the sound. So I could go on and on, but following Christ is laying down one's life. Any man deny himself, pick up the cross and follow me, Jesus said. It is a life of service, a life of, that you have given up uh, uh, ownership of your own self, your own desires, and you say, here I am, Lord. What can I do in service for you? I done made half my crowd mad listening to me online. I know I ain't made nobody mad in here. And you want more, and I, I, I can back up everything I've told you. I can show you stuff some of these guys have said to make your head spin. Authentic Christianity preaches a gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Authentic Christianity preaches that, a, 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 that Jesus is master, Lord, and Savior, Redeemer, amen. The, the authentic Christianity teaches that there is a highway of holiness. The Bible says without holiness, what? No man shall see the Lord. That's authentic Christianity, that you've got to live a separated, holy life under God, and it's only he imputes that righteousness, and you gives you the sanctifying power, the grace to live a life separated, amen. I'm not going to give you an excuse to sin. Authentic Christianity demands separation from this world. Authentic Christianity demands uh, righteous and right living. Come on and say amen. Christianity, authentic Christianity, uh, at, at its very core, is the study of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So many, so many, I don't have a problem with a, 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 a preacher getting money. I, I, I mean, I don't have a problem with, but I do have a problem with a preacher. I, don't, I mean, I should say being blessed. I don't, just like I don't have a problem with you being blessed. But I do have a problem with, with ministers making merchandise out of the gospel of Christ and enriching themselves at the expense of good, hardworking folks like us. Come on in. That's good preaching. I, I sit and watch them say, if you, they want you to send $1,000 But if you can't send a thousand, put it on your credit card. Now, I want to jump through the television screen at this point. Because if you don't have a thousand dollars, do you re and you can't afford to send a thousand, do you really think God wants you to go a thousand dollars in debt on a credit card with a 20% interest rate to send it to one of these clowns? Come on here. And they'll do, I know, boy, I, I tell you what, man, I'm getting so, myself in trouble tonight. And I'm a big boy, I can handle it. But to, 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 to say, send me a thousand if you can't afford it, put it on a credit, that's not authentic Christianity. That is foolishness. And how anybody with a straight face can somehow tie that in to the 
cross of Calvary and the redemptive eternal work of the Lord Jesus Christ, I, it, makes, it almost makes me want to gag. God help us to, 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 to know the truth. The Bible said the truth, you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I like what one man said, I'd rather be in a church with 50 people hearing the truth than to be in a church with 10,000 and a man telling me a lie. Paul wanted the Christian, the Corinthian church to know about God. He wanted them to know about the work of the Holy Spirit. There, and like I say, there's so many other truths that Paul was speaking about. But he's saying in his opening remarks here, or part of his opening remarks, I don't want to know anything but Christ and Him crucified. That's, that's what, I, I didn't get saved because of a church. I didn't get saved because of a denomination. I'm not saved because of, of a personality. Of, 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 and I'm not against big churches. I don't mean that. And big ministries, thank God for big ministries and big churches that are doing the work of the Lord. Thank God for the, the, the kingdom of God being advanced. But it, I, I'm not, I wasn't saved because I was part of a big denomination or a part of a particular church. I was saved because of the, and like you were, of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if a man or a woman, a boy and girl, is going to come and get genuinely saved in this church, are you going to lead that person to the Lord? Are they going to get saved by just calling out on God? It will be because of the cross of Calvary and Jesus' work. Come on here on the cross, amen. Not because of some great sermon, some great song. Praise and worship ain't going to save you. The cross of Jesus saves you. Preaching, amen, this, this will lead people to a decision. And the preaching of the cross, amen, is the power of God unto salvation. I understand that, but it is the redemptive work, amen. God can use a, if God can use a donkey to speak to the madness of a false prophet, he can use anybody he wants to, but that person must point. A, a, a sermon without Christ is not a sermon. It was the cross of Calvary where Christ redeemed mankind. Christ on the cross is the full and the final expression of God's unconditional love to the church, to the world. The cross, honey, if we never shouted another time, God forbid, some of y'all I'm worried about, but... If we never shouted another time in this building, if we never had another praise and worship service, if we never had another gospel sing, as long as the cross of Calvary was preeminent in our midst, as long as the cross of Calvary, what God has done through his son Jesus Christ is preeminent. That is authentic Christianity. That'll keep you saved. That got you saved. That'll keep you saved. And that'll, keep you, that'll get you standing before the Lord Jesus Christ one day. Would you say amen? Just a few more things. A life here, authentic Christianity looks like this. A life poured out, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Can I ask you this question? And being as kind-hearted and loving as sweet as I am, am I talking about you? Is this your life? Can you see this in the reflection of the scriptures and what's being taught? Is your life a sacrifice unto him? Has the cross of Calvary intersected your life, the redemptive work on Calvary, has it intercepted your life and it, it impacts everything that you do? It impacts the way you live, the way you speak, the way you think, the way you act. Come on. Looking at this, the mirror of what authentic Christianity, my life, is my life a living sacrifice? Is it poured out? Is it wholly acceptable unto you? God, do you, it's my life. Are you ready? Does my life glorify Christ? Christ, are you glorified in the way that I live? And I know we all make mistakes. We all fail. I'm, I'm not, I don't mean that. I don't mean this is a perfect example of, of, of any of us. No, I'm saying our life as a whole is, a, is poured out. Paul said the greatest apostle, wrote, writer of two-thirds of the New Testament, a martyr for the cause of Christ. He said, I count it 
but dung those things that I achieved before I became a Christian, before I met him, who? Christ, on the road to Damascus, God, Jesus knocked him off his high, high horse. He met the Savior and his life changed. He considered everything that happened in the past, all of his learning, his education, his dedication, his zeal to persecute the church, all but dung behind it. Can we look in the, the pages of Scripture and say, everything behind me, the, the, the world behind me, the cross before me. God help us tonight to live lives of authentic, authenticity before the Lord. Search our hearts. Try us and see if we're right, God. A life poured out is Christ being glorified in your life. Is he being glorified? If somebody could look at me and say, Brother Bateman, or look at you, Brother such and such and such, can I see Christ glorified in you? Can I see the redemptive work of the cross of Calvary evident, manifested in your life? Am I an authentic Christian? Let's go to Galatians 2 and 20. A couple more points and we'll close. Galatians 2 and 20. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Anybody ever read Paul's last words recorded in 2 Timothy? I fought a good fight. I've kept what? Huh? Faith. What faith is that? Christ. What he deemed the most important thing. And it's what nothing else matters. You know, Paul's not saying in the opening scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He's not saying, he said, I, I only going to know Christ and him crew. It's, it's, if you will, it's a, it's a type of writing from that era that is it, to get your attention. Paul's not saying I'm not going to talk about anything else. But when you peel everything away and get Christianity to its very core, to the very fabric of what Christianity is about, is Christ and him crucified and his redemptive activity in the lives of humanity. And you and I all today, everybody here is saved. I know you are. Everybody here today is here and we're saved because of the cross of Calvary and God's redemptive activity with through Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He said, in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? God, God's not going to God's not going to judge you on the fact that you shouted better than anybody else. God's not going to judge me on the fact that I preach really loud and get really excited, and 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 you know do the huckabuck sometime, and you know and it and and that's just the way I am. And some preachers will do it worse than I do, and some or less. We know the Pentecostal tradition. We, we like it this way. We want our preacher to be excited. That's not what I'm judged on. What I'm judged on is the redemptive activity, the acceptance of what Jesus Christ has done. When you peel away everything that you, well, God uses me to sing, well, praise God. God uses me to teach or to preach or God uses me in this ministry or that ministry. But when you peel away all the everything and get the very fabric of Christianity. I know this is very redundant and repetitive, but when you peel everything about you, your giftings, your knowledge, your wisdom, your growth in the Lord, everything goes back to the cross. It's at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. The burden of my sins, burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith that I received my sight. Paul said, now the life that I live, I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of who? The Son of God who loved me. Remember now, when we're talking about, when Paul was talking to the church, he's talking about the person and the work of Christ and the fulfillment. Let, let me read what I wrote. Christ on the cross is the full and the final expression of God's 
unconditional love. When, when husband and wives take those vows, they say for richer, for poor, sickness and in health. Well, I, I forgot some of the other ones already. That's how long ago that's been I've been married. Then it says till death do we part. And we know a lot of people when they take those vows and they don't take them seriously and they, they divorce. I'm, I'm not talking about that. But they, that it speaks of an unconditional love that, I, I, honey, I'm going to love you when you get old and wrinkled. I'm going to love you when your hair turned gray or turned loose. I'm going to love you when we got money and when we ain't got money. Terrible English. But God has a love that far exceeds that. Paul said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. When we peel all, everything that we stand for, everything that we believe, everything that we do in church, the, even the ch organization that we're a part of. And I love the church of God. You're not going to find anybody in this building who loves the church of God more than me. But honey, the church of God didn't save me. And when a preacher is elevated above, forgive me for the pun, but when a, when a preacher is elevated above the preaching of the cross, we got a problem. When the personality of a preacher and his charisma or his ability to preach or draw crowds or to write books or, or to become famous supersedes and is more important than the cross of Calvary. We're, we're, we're in danger. When a church is known for its musical program or its production or its children's ministries or its uh, outreach more than it's known for the preaching of the cross of Calvary, we're in trouble. Amen? Because when you peel everything away, if it's not for the, except for the cross of Calvary, where would we be? Would you stand? We're going to pray. Uh, this is for Taylor, right? This is for Taylor.